Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Today's guest is an Emmy Award-winning investigative journalist with a career spanning decades. He was the mastermind behind the hit TV show To Catch a Predator on Dateline, where he successfully exposed and stopped online sex predators. His work is truly commendable, and he's always on the move with a new crime streaming network, a podcast, a news magazine, a dozen new documentaries in the works. I don't know where he finds the time. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to my interview with Chris Hansen. Up next. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Well, my pleasure. Me. I've been saying to you like how much I'm in awe of you and how I've known you for watching you on TV for years and years. And I was saying to you that like if I could have a friend group, <laughs> it would have been you, Nancy Grace, and maybe John Oliver. Like you guys are my posse oh, of who wow. I want to be best friends with because I just think you're I'm fantastic. Sitting in good company there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what do you think of the fact that true crime has, been, it has become such a big deal to everybody? It's like people are obsessed. Well, I think some of these stories, you know, are as old as the Bible Mm -hmm. and it's good versus evil. And I think people are fascinated by the stories, you know, just as people continue to be fascinated with Shakespeare or with the theater. And what we do in our particular enterprise style with the Predator franchise or any of the other documentaries we're doing is that we take people inside the commission of a felony. Mm-hmm. They see things they wouldn't normally see. They hear things they wouldn't normally hear. And, and I've got an all-access pass to that because right. I've been doing this for so many years. So mm-hmm. I think people like that inside view. And at the end of the day, if you can get into the mind of a criminal or a predator mm-hmm. and understand a little bit more about how that works, you can prevent people from becoming victims. Right, right, absolutely, that's so important. So before we get into that, talk to me a little bit about how you got into journalism and then how that transpired into investigative and crime. I was lucky because I figured out what I wanted to do pretty early in Mm -hmm. life. We grew up, I grew up, in suburban Detroit, about a mile and a half from the restaurant where Jimmy Hoffa was last seen and presumed kidnapped. Wow. The enduring mystery of Jimmy Hoffa, the mm-hmm. former president of the Teamsters Union. And it was a big crime scene, and the FBI was there, and the local police were there, and the reporters and network correspondents said, you should ride my bike up there to just check it out. Wow. It ran on Telegraph Road. And, and I sort of got bit by the bug then. I was fascinated with this case, and I continued to follow it. And so when I went off to school at Michigan State University, I signed up for the, you know, the campus radio network Mm -hmm. and started as a news reporter at 18 years old. Wow. And so how did you get specifically into following crime as opposed to a different beat? I sort of migrated towards it. I always thought that investigative reporters were cool. Mm-hmm. Those were the guys hanging out with the cops and had sources. And you balance this um, information flow between criminals yeah. who know a lot about it, defense attorneys, prosecutors, and, and, and federal agents and cops. Mm-hmm. And so when I started in television, uh, I was still at Michigan State, and, and I was covering politics a little bit and, and any kind of breaking news there was. And, and as time went by, it's just the part of the business that fascinated me. And I've yeah. been lucky to do a number of features. Right. You know, I joke with my partner, Sean Reck at True Blue, that, you know, maybe if nobody shows up in these, you know, crimes and these stings, we can go do a cooking show in Italy one day. I right. think that would be fun, <laughs> like Stanley Tucci. But, you know, that's not yeah my role but it takes a certain you know a couple different skills like you have to be curious exactly. you have to be someone who wants to follow the story you know some people just want to be talking heads some people want to read the right. news some people want to be in politics so i mean i think so many people are into crime right now too and want to be sleuths on their own Absolutely. which could be dangerous um, <laughs> for them and probably it ruins the story in some ways, it does. You know, we talk about vigilante predator catchers online. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think there's definitely a role for citizen journalists. Mm-hmm. And I think social media has created a platform for people with podcasts and for people with YouTube channels to help crowdsource solutions to crimes. And mm-hmm. I think that's healthy. And I think everybody should have a voice. But sometimes the vigilantes take it a little bit too far. And that creates a volatile and potentially dangerous situation in an effort to get clicks and, yeah. and make money from, from YouTube and platforms right. like it. Right, right. Okay, so let's talk to uh, talk about what most people know you for. I mean, I grew up kind of watching To Catch a Predator. Sure. Um, I was obsessed with it. I mentioned I ha- was having you on the show. And everybody, I you know, sometimes when I have a guest, people will say, 
oh wait, who's that? How do I know their name? Everybody hands down was like, oh, <laughs> To Catch a Predator. I love that guy. Um, and even today when you were just walking into the studio, people here were like, oh my God, when I see Chris they Hansen. I thought they were in trouble. Yes, that's what he said. <laughs> I thought I was in trouble. God, I can't go Have around him. right over there. Yes, yeah. yes. So um, it's very funny. You have an effect on people. But how did you start that show? Tell us the details. To Catch a Predator came about from a conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a reporter in Detroit. In fact, he took my place when I went to NBC News. Mm -hmm. And he told me about this uh, online watchdog group called Perverted Justice. And at that point, Perverted Justice had decoys who would go into chat rooms posing as children. They had profiles. Mm -hmm. And if an adult approached them, made the first approach, and initiated a sexually charged conversation, and set a date to meet, they would post that person's identity and picture on their website, pervertedjustice.com. And sometimes law enforcement would take a look and investigate, and there might be a prosecution, but that's kind of where it ended. There was some public shaming, perhaps, mm -hmm. if people went to the site and saw their neighbor was you know, trying to pick up a kid online. Yeah. And I started to think if we could combine our ability to wire a house with hidden cameras and microphones and use perverted justice as the decoys, this could be compelling. And at the time in 2004, there were a lot of shocking stories about kids meeting adults online, getting killed, getting sexually assaulted, getting ripped off, people of all ages getting ripped off. And so I pitched it because you couldn't do the story without taking people inside the crime. You could, but it wouldn't sustain right. a 20 or 30 minute news magazine story. And so I pitched it at Dateline and they bought it. It was conceived as a, as a single segment or a, you know, a couple of segments. Mm -hmm. And we went to Bethpage, Long Island with perverted justice. The police were not involved in these first investigations. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving out there and I'm thinking to myself, what if I've just wasted tens of thousands of dollars of the network's money and nobody shows up? And yeah. with that, my producer calls and says, where the hell are you? <laughs> We've got two guys scheduled to be here in 45 minutes. And at the end of that two and a half days, 17 men surfaced, including a New York City firefighter. Oh, wow. And I thought, holy hell, this is shocking. And I'm talking to these guys. Mm -hmm. And the first one comes in, and I'm just trying to keep my heart in my chest yeah. and out of my throat. Goes fine. The second guy comes in. Fine. The third guy comes in. At this point, the transcripts of the online illicit conversations are all mixed up on the dining room oh. table in the house. Oh, no. So I walk out there with the wrong set of transcripts. Right. And I said, it says here you wanted to do this, that, and the other thing to a 12 year old. No, that's not me. Excuse me. But that got the second one. Still the wrong transcripts. Finally, on the third try, yeah, yeah that's me. Okay, go ahead. You can answer right. questions. So I have a bunch of questions sure. about all this. Um, at this point, were the cops involved yet? Not in the first two investigations, because we really didn't know what we were going to find. Mm -hmm. After the fact, law enforcement in New York mm -hmm. and law enforcement in Virginia, mm -hmm. outside of Washington, D.C., where we did the second sting, did get involved, and they did make prosecutions. Okay. So did you ever feel unsafe? You know, look, it's edgy. We had security. Mm -hmm. Ron Knight, who is a former NYPD lieutenant who worked at NBC in security, did my security, mm -hmm. Saturday Night Live, several other talk shows. And, you know, he always had me covered. Mm -hmm. I was never really worried about something happening to me. But it's a volatile situation with, you know, everybody there. Yeah, sure. And you're in a contained environment. Right. But that's part of what made and what makes to this day. Yeah the series so compelling to people. You're on the edge there. Yeah. Now, I think, having said that, you know, we've never had an incident. Mm -hmm. uh, we make it absolutely as safe as possible. But you don't really know who's walking in. I mean, you we know. We do our best to know. Right. But in you the don't beginning, know. we didn't know. Right. And But you don't know if they have a gun. You don't know, I mean, if they feel trapped. I mean, I would assume these guys are nervous to a certain extent walking into someone's house that they don't know, and they want to have some sort of protection or something to get away. I mean, I remember watching the show and being nervous for you in some episodes thinking, this guy doesn't seem right in well, the head. Well, it could go a couple different ways. Yeah. Right? And we still get guys who are obviously not right in the head. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some tense moments, you yeah. know, where guys try to flee. And I can't physically stop them, obviously. Right. But as law soon as they go outside, can, yeah. the law enforcement Yeah, can, law yeah. enforcement's right on the perimeter. Right. Know. And let's remind people what the scenario was. So these guys would show up at a house... They'd get out of the car. We'd see them walk in the house, and they're there to meet an underage girl. Child for sex. Right. Girl and or boy. 
Right. Oh, girl or boy. Okay. And but you guys only showed men coming in to see women, or what? what no, there were there were guys who came for boys too. Oh, there were. Okay, yeah. I didn't see those. And so they would come into the house, and they would see an undercover cop, right? Well, yeah, or a decoy, a decoy. Okay. who we retained. Okay. Uh, somebody who was 18, 19, 20, 21, who looked much younger, who had ah, I see. a skill set either as a, someone who's studying theater or somebody who is a, a police, you know, um, volunteer. Right. You know, like a scout. Okay. Explorer. And, and she was always standing there with a thing of laundry getting in sometimes oh, with laundry, oh yeah. let me go finish yeah. folding the laundry or i, I made come you on cookies in, or yeah. let me go do something or i'm going to change or i just stub my toe and in the beginning it was dell of perverted justice oh and she would pose as a boy or girl you know she'd oh, pop a cap. ball cap on and and sometimes you know the decoy in the picture that we'd obtain would look different from dell so she'd be around the corner and say come on in insert excuse here. Oh, got it. Okay. I'll be right down. And the guy would come in and we'd watch him. And, and I do this balancing act, you know, around the corner or in the next room where I don't want the guy to get nervous and bold because right. I want to talk to him. But I do want to see what he does. Does he look around? Does he turn on the TV? Does mm-hmm. he take his coat off? Does he take his shoes off? You know, all those things that are compelling for people to see. So it, it's like, well, do I go now? Do I wait? And, right. and then you go. Right. And then he sees you. Now, as we progressed with the investigation, we have, and to this day in the new investigations, somebody posing as an underage boy or girl. And so there's at least an initial conversation. And okay. those conversations are very telling because you see in real time this guy interact with this child right. with whom he wants to have sex. Mm. And it's very telling. In a recent investigation, we had a 61-year-old doctor who had been texting with somebody he thought was a teenage girl all day as he saw 18 patients, takes a photograph of his genitals Mm -hmm. during the time he's seeing patients. He takes time out to do this, sends it to her, walks into the house, and he's all excited because she's got braces, right? This is part of his kink. Right. So he's brought Oreo cookies Uh. to get stuck in the braces. He's brought wine and soda pop for her. And as he walks in, and we have this long shot down the hallway, and he just reaches over and grabs her behind, which caught him another felony charge, by the right. way. But, you know, there's no wiggle room in the intent there. I mean, yeah. he was there for this girl. And the, and the decoy worked for the sheriff's department in that county, in Genesee County, Michigan. And so at this point, I walk out, and, you know, he basically gives it all up. I mean, he's caught. Now, uh, if they don't know you, do they think that originally you're the father? Or do they think you're Sometimes. The- in fact, in this particular case, the doctor didn't know me. Okay. Hadn't seen the show, didn't know what was going on, knew he was in trouble. Mm. And he essentially gave it all up, told me what he did, told me how many patients he had seen. He knew it was wrong. He had met other young women online. Oh, my gosh. And now he's facing serious felony charges. When the, pol- when the detectives from the sheriff's office came in to question him, suddenly he feigns this heart attack, mm. like that's going to get him out. And it's oh, a of quite, if you look on True Blue, the streaming platform where the, where the show is, you'll see that. It's just... It's it, it just so compelling to watch this right. play out. Right. You know, well, this, because he uh, thought it was just you guys. He didn't think he was going to actually. Well, yeah. And caught. then, yeah. you know, when the when the detectives came in to talk to him, then he's going to have the heart attack. I'm a good guy. I don't do this sort of thing. Well, right. you're here now. Right. You know. So, oh, my goodness. So what is it like? Is the, is the crime beforehand so he's already going to be caught or you need him to come in and have those conversations with you? Or are you just trying to get inside his mind while you're talking to him? All of that. Okay. So generally, the crime of solicitation of a minor, uh, attempted lewd and lascivious behavior with the minor, is committed online, mm-hmm. almost universally across all states. And in some cases, even if they don't show up at the house, a couple of weeks later, the sheriff's department, like in Polk County, Florida, will go out and do a dragnet and arrest all these guys. Right. Uh, so they don't have to make it on the show. They don't arrested. have to make it on the show yeah. to get arrested. But obviously that's where we get inside their heads yeah. and figure out what they were doing. And that's the, the payoff mm-hmm. is them showing up and talking. And what do you think you've learned about how to spot um, one of these guys? You know, that's a great question. And I've often thought about it. But the only thing these guys have in common is that they don't stand out of a crowd. Hmm. You'll see a rangy guy walk in and say, eh, yeah, yeah. I could have picked him out. Yeah. You know, I saw him on the subway. Right. But generally speaking, they look like regular guys. 
you know, somebody who drives a truck, somebody who's a doctor. We had a guy who was a retired engineer. We had a guy in, a, in one of the recent investigations in Ohio who had a great job and had driven five hours from Chicago to Ohio, mm. Dayton, Ohio, for a teenage girl, and then admitted to me that he had done this two other times. Wow. And it was actually wearing a necklace, a friendship necklace that one of those girls had given him because it, he was able to groom her to the point where she didn't even see anything inappropriate about it. These yeah. guys know how to groom. And, you know, that's what parents need to understand is that when I was growing up, we were told don't talk to strangers. Mm -hmm. Good advice then, good advice today. But the problem is with these predators online, they're so adept at grooming that the stranger on Wednesday is no longer a stranger by Friday when he's chipping oh, yeah. away and working on tearing down these barriers that traditionally exist in our society between adults and children. Right, and it's so different than when we were younger. I mean, even just the online access now, especially oh. since after COVID, my daughter, as I was telling you, is she just turned 11. Right. She knows more about things from going online and oh. is more online than you know anyone in our generation. Like, all those kids live online. Even from my my kids to your daughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, my guys are, you know, 31, 29, 23, and 21. I mean, it's a whole different world mm -hmm. from the 31 year old yeah. to your 11 year old. Right. Way different. Yeah. So it is really scary. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's really interesting that, I, you know, I was, as I was taking my daughter to school this morning, she said, Who are you interviewing? I said, You. And she said, oh, I know him. I, you must be on TikTok, <laughs> TikTok or something. Exactly. Yeah. And she said she had seen clips of different episodes. Oh, yeah. And I explained, oh, well, there's someone that comes in and he sits down with them. And it's somebody who's, you know, there to hurt a young girl. I didn't know how to actually preface it right. with her. But she knew the whole thing. I, yeah. She was like, mom, I know that show. It's, uh, <laughs> the TikTok thing has been amazing. And I was reticent to get involved in it. And I didn't understand how it would help what we do. But it, it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's leading people from the TikToks to subscribe and follow True Absolutely, Blue, the streaming yeah. crime network. And, and there are some videos on there, and I don't pretend to understand the algorithm of mm. TikTok. In fact, my wife runs the TikTok yeah. part of this whole sure. operation. But we have videos on there that have hit 7.2 million views. Wow. wow. And so what has happened, which has been a, a gift for me and for my producers and the work we do, is that we're now in our third generation of followers. Yeah. And people say, well, did it bother you when South Park did uh, an episode on Chris Hansen at To Catch a Better? No, it didn't. I I'm okay with being made fun of yeah. as long as it continues this dialogue and the awareness right. about very important topics, which we cover in these, in these investigations. Right, and it shows how relevant it uh, is. what you're doing is. You are, you know, your catchphrase of have a, a seat. have a seat. Yeah, and how did you come up with that, by the way? You know, it wasn't by design, mm -hmm. quite honestly, Rachel. It was just... I needed to get control of the situation. Yeah. So it was, have a seat, have a seat right over there. Have, you know, I need you to have a seat mm -hmm. because the, I can't have the guy wandering around the house. Right. And if I, you know, raise the red flag too soon and police come in to get him, then you I've lost have, control of the situation, yeah. not only from a security standpoint, but from an editorial mm -hmm. television production standpoint. And that was really one of the things after that second investigation in Herndon, Virginia, outside of D.C., you know, we had the rabbi, we had a guy walking naked, we had a military intelligence officer, we had all the teacher, we had all these people. Oh, wow. And they left. And it was very unsatisfying. Oh, you mean they just walked out? They walked they out because you. we didn't have law enforcement collaborating. Yeah, oh, I see. Well, again, those guys were prosecuted after the fact. But by the third investigation, it became pretty clear that we, you know, we needed to out of social responsibility and out of satisfying our viewers from a television production standpoint, we needed to see uh, a resolution, right. some closure, an arrest. And we've, you know, adapted how we do it over the course of 19 years how to many, where we are today. How many arrests do you think you guys have made? I think we're, we're 570, 580, close wow. to 600. Yeah, virtually everybody, since the police were involved, virtually everybody gets arrested. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority are prosecuted, either a conviction at trial, a guilty or a no contest plea. But very few have walked away. And what do you say to these critics who say this is entrapment? It's, it's not an entrapment because we don't create 
the crime. I mean, this guy was yeah. out there looking. Mm -hmm. uh, the decoys never make the first contact. Mm -hmm. So it's always, and, and that's a threshold. If the guy doesn't make the first contact, doesn't raise the specter of sex first, mm. then it doesn't reach our threshold of even inviting him over or giving him the address. Right. So that's the protection, the constitutional protection is right there. Right, right. And the guilty pleas speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, take it on the nose and go do four years, two years. Mm -hmm. Some get probation, registration as a sex offender. Some plead to commission of a crime with a computer. You know, it's never enough for the law, men and women who do it, but justice is served. Yeah. And what you hope is that for the percentage of guys who do this, for whom therapy would help, some sort of monitored program, and it does for a certain subset of these guys. Yeah. Some guys are hardcore, need to be locked up for life. Some guys are in the middle, and some guys made a mistake. And they can be fixed. What kind of sentence do they get? How long... It's gone from probation and registration as a sex offender to, I think, the highest sentence is 24 years in prison. Wow. And that's somebody who had a previous sure. history of yeah, committing these kinds of crimes. Yeah, depends who they are, right? right? Exactly. Do you guys do any follow-up to oh, find sure. out how they are? That's kind of what the podcast is all about. Okay. So the podcast, Predators I've Caught with Chris Hansen, is essentially me going back and taking a look at all these cases. Mm. And because so many of these interviews are done on the fly, you know, where I get the transcripts minutes or seconds before the guy walks in, yeah. and I'm trying to sort through it in my mind, I now have the luxury of going through, luxury if you call it a luxury, but the creepy luxury of mm -hmm. going through and, and, and immersing myself in this and going back and looking at the interviews and the videos, and then figuring out where this guy is today. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of feedback from listeners of the podcast. We had a woman on who was watching the predator investigations in college, you know, reruns. Yeah. Recognizes a guy, said, oh my God. Wow. It's a guy who I caught in Riverside County, California in 2006, who she met online in 2009, who said he was 18 when he was really, you know, well into his 20s and sure. she was 16. They had, she was in a very vulnerable state. They had a sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, not knowing that he was a registered sex offender and much older. And, you know, she finds this out all these years later. And it's like, you know, oh, my God. Yeah. And so you, you get people who call, and I'll, I'll do interviews with them. And it's wow. very telling, you know, to go back and look at, these, look at these cases. Were there ever any guys who walked in? Uh, first of all, you never had women wa walk in on the Not in any of these investigations. Yeah. And, and the, the, the folks who study this say that it's because in the case of a female predator, you're more likely to have a teacher-student scenario. Okay. In other words, you, you have um, somebody who knows their victim. Female predators don't like the anonymity, where in some cases the male predator gets off on it. Right, right. Okay, so I want to go back to that in one second. But, um, well, actually, let's talk about that. For females, sure. what do you think of, like, Ghislaine uh, Maxwell? Do you think, you know, and she was just uh, sentenced, right? So right. Um, do, do you consider her a female predator? I think so. She was an aiding and abetting predator for sure. Yeah. I mean, whatever her motivation was, whether she was taking part in the sexual liaison or not. Yeah. And some of the evidence suggests that she was, or at least, you know, voyeuristically viewing. Yeah. Um, she was procuring. Yeah. And and I'm still working on interviews and stories related to that entire you are. Epstein situation. In fact, I'll tell you an interesting story. And one of my all-time career regrets mm -hmm. is that in about 2015, 16, I was working on the Epstein story. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of insider help. Mm -hmm. And we tried to fashion a sting of some sort. Now, he'd already been in trouble in Florida, in Palm Beach. And obviously, he had a residence here in New York. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't do it the way we wanted to do it. And quite honestly, I got busy with other projects, but it was the Miami Herald who kept chipping away at this story right. and working on it, reporting it, and, and reporters there got these victims to come forward. But the grooming that took place there and the targeted uh, efforts hmm. to commit human trafficking on vulnerable young women are astounding. Right. And, and there are still some of those victims who haven't spoken out publicly, and, and I'm hoping 
that at some point some of them will. Well, and that brings me to another point, which is it's so important for even local reporters or whatever a, to keep without following. the Miami Herald and Julie K. Brown, who yeah. wrote a book yeah. on this. The prosecution likely doesn't happen. And the U.S. attorney at the time said uh, as much. Right, because he had let, been let off before. He, he got that sweetheart plea deal. But also what's important about that is it creates a safe environment for victims to feel like, right, I can come exactly. out. exactly. And, and I'm not going to get trashed yeah. or, or beat up. I mean, imagine being a victim in that case yeah. and watching him get a year of going to the county jail five days a week and then having or you know being able to go to his office during the day and i mean that that's unheard of yeah yeah and i think they tried to create the impression the defense did in that case that this was a gray area case that okay he hired some underprivileged girls but they were all of legal age there were some back rubs and some things it's icky it's you know predator like but it's not that illegal well it sure as hell was right and this was a campaign of human trafficking that went on for years yeah yeah. Um, and to go back to the question I was starting before before we got into Ghislaine, um, uh, were there any men that came in that you felt like it was a story that really stuck out to you? It was either um, upsetting to you or you felt bad for the guy or you, you, oh, yeah. you know, what would that be? There have been so many. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about a hundred way tie for first. But the one that really sticks out happened in Fort Myers. And it was a Sunday and it was the last guy of the investigation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're on our toes, we're paying attention, but there's sort of a sense like, okay, we've achieved this once again, and we're going to do this last case, mm-hmm. and then we're going to wrap up. The guy pulls up, and there's no mention of this in the chat online. The guy pulls up in his SUV, gets out, and goes to the driver's side rear door. And we think he's going to get pizza or beer or you know, wine coolers. He opens the door and he leads his four or five year old son out by the hand and walks up the driveway of this beautiful big home we had rented in Fort Myers. He brought his kid with him. Wow. Now, I don't think he was going to involve the kid in the sexual liaison he had set up with a teenage boy, but the fact that he would bring a kid because his wife was working that day and he was going to set him up with a video in the other room while he did what he did was just so disturbing Mm. and so just mind-bogglingly sad yeah. to everybody involved and the guy walks in he's got his kid with him and I'm face to face with him about as close as you and I are mm-hmm. and I said the only thing I could think of which was I know why you're here you know why you're here but because your son is with you I'm not going to take you through it all mm. there's some people out there that are going to resolve this yeah you're saying yeah I wasn't going to do anything and talk right. to them and the female officer scooped up the child and they took him away where does a child end up in a circumstance like well that? the story continues because the child couldn't live in the home with the mother and father right and the mother of the child didn't kick the dad out oh my god so the child had to go live with relatives and the mother and father the predator and um, his wife went on to have another child. Oh, come on. Wow. And the DFS, you know, Department of Family and Child Services, DFCS, was so upset that I had people calling me about this mm. for years afterwards. Yeah. Saying you wouldn't believe what happened to this guy. Yeah, it must be hard for you to see all these ha- things happen and then just go home at night. Well, it is, you, you know, look, you learn to compartmentalize, mm-hmm. right? You can't let it take over your life. And, and you know, this is what I do. Mm. And so, yeah, we have sort of a dark sense of humor about it all. Mm. And, and there is a dark, humorous part of these things. Some yeah. of these guys say things and do things that are weirdly funny. <laughs> right. Right? Right. The guy tells the detectives to pound sand, but, you know, Matt Bonjean in, you know, Polk County, Florida, in Orlando on business, who came to do a mother-daughter hookup, Oh loves Chris Hansen shows. Going right. to talk to me and give me the whole detail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk about that. How these some of these guys yeah. fanboy over yeah. you when they see you. Yeah. It's it's it's. And it's surprising to me, by the way, that they haven't seen the show or they have seen the show. Oh, so we get in the transcripts. Guys will say, "This sounds like a Chris Hansen thing." Wow. Is this a Chris Hansen thing? And the decoy says, "Well, who's that?" Or they'll even name the sheriff. Is this a Grady Judd thing? Is this a Chris Swanson thing? You know, two of the sheriffs with whom we work. And ha, 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 that's funny. I don't want to get in trouble either. You know, and it, it, it speaks not to the stupidity of these guys. It speaks to the drive mm. and the compulsion 
they get this fantasy in their mind. And I think a lot of it is fed by porn, yeah. child porn specifically. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to the experts who go into the prisons and do the dark work of talking to these people, yeah. when they have no interest in being dishonest because they're there for however many years, yeah. they will tell you routinely that they had offended many times before they got caught and that the, um, the viewing of child pornography was involved. What would you say to parents about what's the best way to protect their kids online right now? The best way is to have a running dialogue, an open conversation about what the dangers are. And it starts with the very second a child gets online. Yeah. There are adults online who want to trick kids. Mm-hmm. And then it has to graduate in sophistication as the child gets older. Yeah. We see horrifying things. I've got a, one of the documentaries I'm working on right now is on sextortion. and how these criminals in West Africa and East Europe are posing as teenage girls, targeting teenage boys, 15, 16, with suggestive pictures, sexually suggestive pictures. They say, I'll show you mine, you show me yours. Mm -hmm. The boy sends something, Mm -hmm. you know, a a, a sexual picture, and then they start the extortion. Give me a hundred dollars. We're going to put this on the internet, and and, and at that moment, and kids think their life that, is over. They think it's life. Their yeah. their world is their yeah. uh, online image. Yeah. yeah. And what's going to happen when Grandma sees my junk online? Well, right. Grandma's not going to care. Nobody else is going to care. But in that moment, they can't find their way out of it, and these kids are committing suicide yeah. at an alarming rate. I've sat with four sets of parents in the last couple months. Good kids, good grades, athletes headed off to college, whose parents wouldn't have said anything negative to them, right. except we love you and don't be an idiot again. And these kids are dead. Right. And these, these predators are attacking them with shame, too. With shame. Like, with shame. And, and they know. So they, they give them money. Yeah. They run out of money. How much money could a 16-year-old have? You yeah. know, they're using their, their gift cards. Mm. And, and I, I interviewed last, a week ago today, mm-hmm. I was in South Carolina interviewing a state representative whose son got caught up in this. Wow. And was checking on all three kids at night, passed his son. Little did he know the son had a gun in his underwear, walked into the bathroom and shot himself to death. Oh, wow. In the same house where we did this interview. And he passed laws cracking down on this sort of crime and to educate kids. But you, you got, it's really important. And you got to reach out and say, look, this stuff is out there. Right. It can happen. If it does, just come to me and we'll resolve it. Right. And again, these weren't bad parents. And anyone could be duped, it not could, just Anyone kids. could be duped, and yeah. it's happened to the elderly people with yeah. financial scams. It's, you know, we've seen this, but you've you got to keep that conversation going. Mm-hmm. And there isn't one set of parents I've interviewed on this who will say, I would have punished them, I would have banished them, I would have made fun of them. No, they would say, look, you're okay. Yeah. This, this is not the end of the world. Right. And, and they wish they had that chance, but the, kid, the kid's undeveloped mind, especially a boy at 15 or 16, does not allow them to think their way through it. Right. And they're dead. Right. And it's so sad. I've seen so many of these documentaries or news shows about that, and it just breaks my heart. But, you know, even my daughter, who's just turned 11, you know, there are things that she probably wouldn't say to me if she got herself into a predicament. So what would you say to children about either how to spot somebody who's not true or what to do to kind of save themselves? Well, if you don't know them in real life, you don't know them online. That's right. And again, this is now in a world where people meet the loves of their life mm-hmm. online. People uh, go to dating sites and end up getting married. You know, there's right. a legit. There are a lot of legitimate sites, but you're not safe just because it's Instagram or a mainstream site. You don't yeah. have to be on Skip the Games or Kick or Badu or Whisper or any of these sites. We have a case where a 12-year-old girl was groomed on Instagram, mm. left uh, her family's home through a bedroom window, met a guy who took her to a hotel, videotaped the sexual act, and nobody found out until she went to the emergency room, 12 years old. Wow. They found him, they tracked him down. Wow. But it's, 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 it's shocking the depths that these guys will sink to to fulfill this fantasy with a child. We had a guy who was arrested in Ohio. Two weeks later, they popped him in a hotel room with a 14-year-old girl videotaping the sexual encounter. He just got arrested in a sting operation. Wow. Had to talk to me. 
yeah. had to be interrogated by detectives, had to, you know, get out on bail. Right. So Two the, weeks later, in a neighboring county. So the drive just sometimes does not. For it, some of these bigger guys. bigger than, yeah. than, than the consequences. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, let's go into some cases um, that you're familiar with, um, or just to get your take. So what about, like, Jared, the subway guy? Is that his name? Jared, the subway yeah. guy, yeah. Did you follow that story? I followed it watching it. I, I okay. didn't cover it as a, as a journalist, so I don't necessarily have the ins and outs of it. But mm. again, here's a guy who follows a pattern. Mm. Uh, a predator doesn't have to be some low life someplace. Here's a guy who had a... Uh, who used his platform used his to platform get to kids. platform to yeah. get to kids. And yeah. he was a guy who was a, somewhat of a star, who had lost the weight, had a big right. campaign. Which, by the way, makes it him. easier for kids to just right. fall for him. Right, right? exactly. Because they think he's and, a star. And he was able to, you know, do all this and get the pornography and, and lure these kids. And again, he's picking vulnerable targets mm -hmm. and using his celebrity to do it. Right. Are there some cases that you're following right now that you're, like, obsessed with, that you're curious about, that you're working on? We have one called The Facebook Fiend. Okay. And here's a guy who nobody would really know about. He's not famous. But he had created this online image of a guitar player, loving soul, loved animals. And he would find women who were a little bit vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Not, not and, you know, everybody worked. Everybody had a career, a job. Some, had, some were single moms. Mm -hmm. But he would create this relationship online and then say, you know, I'm waiting for the band checks to come. Will you fly me to see you? Mm. He's living in Tucson, so they would fly him. That's my boyfriend from online. Fly him to Baltimore or to uh, Olympia, Washington or wherever, and he'd get there. And he was a horrible, drug-addicted alcoholic who beat these women, sexually assaulted them, took money from them, and they're just like, wait a minute, what happened to me? Right. But it's so stunning because they have months and months of conversations, and he does this. He's probably good for about 40 cases. Wow. And so now we've gotten involved, and now there's a criminal prosecution. Now he's facing charges, and I was just down in Arizona chasing him around a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a big documentary. Um, and we've got, you know, several others. Jumana Kidd, who was the target of a, of a crazy con artist named Tracy Hutsana, who just pleaded guilty and went away mm -hmm. for, for four years. I mean, Jumana and other victims of Tracy Hutsana, it's this wild, compelling story about how this woman was able to create this identity that allowed her to scam so many people out of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, she took Jumana for like $3 million. Wow. So I have a question about something like that because, you know, I recently interviewed um, – Sarma Melangalis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember her from um, Bad Vegan on Netflix. Oh, sure, yeah. And people wondered after that, watching that series, whether or not she was a criminal or whether or not she had been abused by a psychological, right. you know, a guy who, Cult so, type yeah, thing. exactly, yeah. and somebody who psychologically abused her. And it's an interesting question because, listen, I really like her. I think, you know, she was a fantastic interview. She's a, a girl I like. But, you know, people will look at her and say, you're so smart. How could you have fallen for something like this? You gave over, you know, almost $2 million to a guy right. who you met online and, you know, you kept giving him this money and you just couldn't get out of it. So, like, what's your experience with people that fall into these traps? Well, we see it with the Nigerian scams. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent a year once going after these guys and, and they're, they're so adept at targeting vulnerable people. Yeah. Um, women and, and smart men. people. And, yeah, smart people. <laughs> yeah. And they use a romantic hitch. Mm -hmm. And in this world of internet relationships and dating and romance, people just want, you know, at the end of the day, everybody wants to be loved. Yeah, right? sure. And, and so if you've got four kids and you're working two jobs and your only love is this good looking strapping lumberjack of a guy who sends you nice messages and mm -hmm. treats from here and there, it's not really him. Yeah. We've got this other case. There's a guy who's a you know a model in his 60s, handsome guy out in the Hamptons. They were taking his picture mm. and scamming women out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Same thing with Dirty John. Dirty John. Uh, I had Tara Newell on here, yeah. and we talked about that whole scenario. But you know, people couldn't believe that her mom would get so wrapped up in this relationship with this guy who was financially. And then you're invested. Yes. Right. You're invested in it, and to to call it off means that you were stupid and you didn't see the red flags exactly. in the beginning. And so 
well, he's made this promise. He'll right. do this. He'll do that. And, and if I leave, it's over. So I don't yeah. get my money back yeah. or I don't get, you know, these promises he it's, made me. It's yeah. the Ponzi scheme. Yes. It's right. made off. It's everybody else. Don't get your money out because the big thing is coming. Right. So now talk to me about your network now that you have the streaming network. True Blue, which people can find at watchtrueblue.com, T-R-U-B-L-U, is a streaming network mm-hmm. which has – all my new documentaries, all the new Predator investigations, which we have under the Takedown franchise, mm-hmm. uh, available. It's just like Netflix for crime. Yeah. So we have that, and, and we have at least a dozen new uh, investigations coming out, um, documentaries. But we also have a lot of content already there. So okay. the White Boy Rick investigation, which oh. is how I met the co-founder of True Blue, Sean Reck. Mm -hmm. I had broken the White Boy Rick story as a young reporter in Detroit in Mm -hmm. the 80s, and he decided to do a documentary on it, so he interviewed me for that. It became very successful, and so we started thinking, wow, we could do a streaming network for crime. And he had already done it successfully in the religious world. Mm. He and a partner had founded American Gospel TV, which is the most successful streamer you've never heard of, (laughs) unless you're in in that world. And um, and they they had the template already in place. It had become a huge success. And mm-hmm. so when it came time to do a streamer for crime, Sean and and the rest of the folks at True Blue knew how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I provided the brand and the franchise and the contacts and the access yeah. that I've developed over you know forty years of doing this. And so to me, it's enormously liberating. Yeah. The last couple of um, projects I did for the networks, you know, took 12, 18 months to put together. We expedite this. We control the content, the distribution of the content, and we own the content. So again, I, I have no bone to pick with the networks. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do this today without 25 years at the network. Yeah. You know, that gave me the platform to do this. So I'm very grateful for mm-hmm. that. But it is time for me to take it to the next level. And that's what we're doing with True Blue. Is there one show that if somebody is going to download it um, and get on there that they should start off with? They should start with the, the takedown investigations. Okay. And so we have the takedown investigations, which are the predator cases, mm-hmm. um, more compelling than ever, more shocking than ever. Yeah. And so you're still More doing in-depth this. interviews. Yes, yeah. exactly. Same and exact more, stuff. I mean, again, just with a, a new name, a doctor, and, and these guys who've traveled so many miles to mm-hmm. meet a child, and they sit and talk. We had a 71 year old guy show up in Ohio, and the scenario was to meet a 13 year old girl who was being offered by her father, and so the detective is playing the father, and the deputy is playing the decoy. This guy walks in with a milkshake. For the girl. Mm-hmm. And this plays out in real time. And so he sits down on the couch and he's telling the dad, you know, it's good you're doing this because boys her age don't know how to teach them about sex. And, and he had that sort of whistle in yeah. his voice. Like if you watch Family Guy, right. Herbert the Pervert, sure. it was like this guy in real life. Yeah. It's like the cartoon character came to life in this thing. And he, he's eyeing the girl. And this goes on for minutes and minutes and minutes. But it, it shows you who's out there yeah. and what they're capable of doing. Right, that is so scary. And then he sits and talks to me and he goes, yeah, you know, you look familiar. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> 71 years old. Wow. And then he just told you everything? Yeah, gave yeah. it all up. Gave it all And up. defended it. And on top of that, I asked him what he did for a living. He said, I'm retired. I said, but I work uh, as, a, as a counselor for people with sex addiction. Oh my gosh. In prisons. Oh, so here he is. Wow, that's crazy. Um, so this network does not just do predator stuff. Though. No, it's all no. Crime. So it's it's all crime, and we have some features on there too. There's a like a firehouse eats where you know, the crews go to different firehouses around the country and they show recipes of firehouses. So okay. there, there's a little bit of lighter fare there, and there's some documentaries that we didn't produce that we have aggregated and okay. we have the rights to, so people can see those there. But it also is a place for our new news magazine, True Crime Nation, okay. where we'll do some of these other uh, long-form stories, some of the interviews that I'll get. You know, if there's breaking news, for instance, we now have a live capability, and we've been working oh. on live shows. So we can we can talk about things as they happen, whether it's the the woman who fought off the attacker in the gym in Florida who, you know, was a, we had video of this, security mm-hmm. video. I mean, that's a great interview to have. Yeah. Um, the hero from the... Uh, 
nightclub shooting in Colorado. Mm-hmm. You know, all those people, you know, from Ben Crump to whoever law enforcement uh, agent there is who's involved in the middle of a crime, all these people will come talk to me. And right. we hook it up live like that, and we have those episodes on true crime so Nation, you're and then true. i assume you're doing um long form stories on like the idaho murders or Lori vallow we're looking at looking at all of that yeah, yeah. what's yeah. your thought on Lori vallow i thought that story was incredibly so disturbing disturbing yeah. yeah and i didn't have a i didn't do a lot of reporting there i watched it like you did yeah and, and have some insight and, and have friends obviously covering it in depth i mean i binge that i i even listened to like the 911 call when the brother you know passed out in the bathroom and the stepson oh, found yeah. him. I mean, I got so into that. And I thought for a while, well, of course, before they found the kids, of course these kids are dead. Of course she did yeah. it. But, like, look at all the people around them. They're not on vacation them. in Hawaii Yeah, with but the look parents. at all the people around them that are dead that yeah. no one's really talking oh, about. Yeah. The wife, the, the husband, it's the brother. It's just shocking how that could have – and I'm sure there were – you know, investigations and there was law enforcement uh, looking at it, but right. it just the fact that they got away with it for as long as they did. Right, right. It's about time that they. Got and thank justice. God they found those yeah. kids and could like put that to rest a little bit. But she's she's still That's, saying she's not guilty, correct? Uh, yeah, and and she's you know this whole cult thing and the doomsday thing. It's like God, how do people get talked into that? Yeah, to be able to kill your own children I, it just, for something it's, like it's, that. It's, I, I just I don't understand how somebody's mind could get that twisted yeah and and i guess nobody can no regular human being can and that's why these stories continue to be so fascinating i mean the the uh, uh idaho college campus killings. yeah i mean imagine being one of those parents no i know how you send your kid off to uh, you know uh, uh, a college in the midwest and it's safe and some horrible monster decides he's going to commit a mass murder for for what yeah yeah, it's awful. You know? um, and is there any unsolved crime that you are looking to cover? Do you guys cover? Un- we will do some of that, too. Um, is there one that you are into that you want to cover, that you want to get to the bottom of? God, there's, there's, there's so many. Um, and, and, and what interests me about this is now that we have the DNA science yeah. and the 23andMe. I mean, look at the, all these murders getting solved now. And, and it's not great television necessarily to, to dig into the science part of it, but it's awfully rewarding yeah. if you have the right people telling the story. Do you think anyone will ever really find out what happened to jean Benet Ramsey or Madeline McCann? Well, that's the one. Madeline McCann and jean Benet Ramsey are the two. Yeah. And we talked about True Crime Nation. John Ramsey did an interview with me uh, a couple months ago for uh, True Blue. And there's so much to unpack there yeah. and so many people in the circle and they spent so much time focused on him mm. and then, and on his wife, his late wife, and they wasted a lot of time. You so know. you don't think he has anything I to do with it? I don't think he has anything to do with it. And wh- why would he spend time with me if he, I right. mean, I, mean I, I, I don't think there's any, any way he had anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. But he was under suspicion. And I was out there as a reporter in 1996, I guess it was, uh, yeah. 96, 97, when that happened, for Dateline, and interviewed um, John Douglas, who was the FBI profiler retained by the family. Yeah. And, you know, so I was in the thick of it. And everybody, well, it must be the parents. And everybody, they're home. What else could have happened? Or maybe it was the brother. And it wasn't the brother. Right. It wasn't the parents. This is devastated. Yeah. Not just the loss of a daughter, but it was the second child he had lost, by the way. There was a car accident. He lost right. another child. Right, right. And... People wanted to point to the, you know, the beauty contests and the performances and all that. Eh, maybe that brought her to the attention of a bad predator who mm-hmm. did kill her. Mm-hmm. And, and there, there's a primary suspect there. Mm-hmm. And the question is, can they resolve this case? I, I mean, John Douglas is, I mean, uh, uh, John Ramsey is doing everything in his power to do it. He's cooperating. He's funding this. He's, he's fighting. Yeah. You know, he, in, in the son yeah. who got a bad rap on all this. Right, right. You know, he's trying to carve out some sort of life for himself. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's, that's among the most tragic. And, and Madeline McCain, too. Now, I, I read where they were doing a search for her body, her remains, uh, someplace overseas in the, in the area where she went missing. And I think there again, you know, you can go back and question, you know, is it okay to leave a child alone with a baby monitor? I think many of us of a certain age have been close by and listened right. to a baby monitor. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know the exact distance, but certainly you don't think your child is going to be kidnapped. No, of course not, especially in a resort like that. Yeah. 
Um, there are so many interesting cases for me that I followed those ones especially, but like, um, I guess his name is Fritzl. Do you remember Joseph, is that his name, from Austria where he um, put his daughter in the basement and then she proceeded to have five, seven kids by him, right. two died. Ugh. And then finally one of the kids pretended to be sick or was sick and he brought her to the emergency room and she had a note in her pocket and finally all the kids right. got saved. Well, that's like the Cleveland case. Yes. The Ariel Castro. We do, uh, oh, True right. Blue Studios mm-hmm. are actually in downtown Cleveland because mm-hmm. we can have this huge, you know, 16,000 square feet of studio there and yeah. Sean is from Cleveland, my partner. And uh, so we do a lot with Cleveland Missing, which is kind of a group that came out of that, that horrible tragedy. Yeah. And uh, Gina De Jesus and, and her um, aunt formed it and they coordinate with the families of missing people to make sure they get to the police on time and all the information gets changed but Mm -hmm. that Ariel Castro case is just yeah horrifying and what ended up happening to him he was killed in prison he was yeah wow died in prison yeah but he had a daughter with one of the girls right yes he did and does anyone follow up with these three women? Uh, um, just the one, Gina De Jesus, okay. and she's you know she's having her life. She's right. doing the best she can. Yeah, um, that's a crushing thing to have happen to him. Yes, of course. Um, okay, so what is your current binge in the true cl- crime networks that you could watch? Current binge in true crime. Or my a podcast. Like, pod- what, what's something that you really follow my that you binges, love? My binges, because I'm so involved in crime, my binges tend to be more entertainment. I like to oh. get out of it a little bit. So, Ted Lasso. Okay, mine too. I love that. Um, <laughs> the other one that I'm insanely devoted to is Winning Time. I don't know what that About is. the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh, okay. From the time Jerry Buss bought them. Yeah. And they've only had one season, but I, I keep tapping... Uh, my toe waiting for the next season, right. not, which is going to be anytime soon. I just thought that they had done a wonderful job with that. I mean, literally, I will make dinner and make it make sure it's done mm-hmm. before that show comes on, so I can watch it. and And I usually watch it alone. I don't right. watch it with anybody else. Right? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, who is the most intimidating person you've ever interviewed? Do you think? That's a good question. <laughs> Probably the happy face killer. I don't know. So this was a crime that took place in Oregon. The guy was arrested for being a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed him in prison. And they walk him in, and he's a giant of a human being. And he's got, you know, handcuffs on. Mm -hmm. He's got leg irons on. And they walk him into the interview room in the prison. And he's just, I mean, any (laughs) time. He wasn't going to get away with it. I mean, he, he was just a giant of a man. And he was, you know, accused of all these murders. And we sat as close as we are, mm-hmm. albeit with his leg chains and yeah. several guards around. But I'm thinking, you know, if he grabbed one of those light stands, <laughs> he's not going to get out of here. Right. And I'm not going to get hurt, but it's going to be a, be a Donnybrook of sorts. Right. right. That's probably, I think that he would have to be at the top of the list. Right. Okay. Um, if you could switch careers and be any other profession, what would you choose? Probably a lawyer. Okay. Similar skills. I would think so. Yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't go. I always had. I applied to law school twice when I was much younger and got in. And and just every time I got in, in those days in the '80s, it was like very fashionable to have a law degree and be a journalist. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all that was it. That was the be all end all. And then every time I would get accepted and weigh the effort it would take, I got a better job at television, so that quickly went by the wayside. Right, right, <laughs> okay. Um, well, obviously, everything that you're doing, putting these people in jail, you know, all these, this with this new network, inviting us into all these different crimes and documentaries, I think is really fantastic. Tell us really quickly where we can find you um, on Instagram, and also what, what, how we can watch the program. Instagram is official Chris Hansen. Twitter is at Chris Hansen, all over Facebook. TikTok is have a seat with Chris Hansen yeah. for our TikTok friends. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of them. It's, yep. it's a magnificent way to, to share your contacts. And um, watch trueblue.com for all the details, T-R-U-B-L-U. Mm-hmm. And the podcast is Predators I've Caught with Chris Hansen. And you can get that wherever you, you can get find on, your wherever podcast. you find the podcast. Well, thank you right so much. Right next to yours. Yes, right. <laughs> I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you, Rachel, it was for such having a pleasure. me. I appreciate it.
Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.